Hello and welcome to Soft Cover, the print's online venue to launch non-fiction books. My name is Raghav Vichandani, and in today's episode, we're going to talk about a Bloomsbury publication, and I have it for you right over here. The book is called Between Hope and Despair, 100 Ethical Reflections on Contemporary India. And I'm really excited to bring to you our conversation with the author of that book, Professor Rajiv Bhargav. Professor Bhargav is an honorary fellow at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies in Delhi and the director of its Parikh Institute of Political Thought. He has written extensively on political theory, be it his own books or contributing to the Hindu. Over the years, he's also developed a wealth of experience as a visiting professor at various universities around the world and was most recently a senior research fellow at the University of Leipzig. Professor Bhargav, welcome to the show. Thank you. Okay, so, so let's get right into it. Um, as the title mentions, the book has a, a hundred essays, but you also have 14 pages of an introduction section. So mm -hmm. for, our, for our readers and for our audience, can you introduce your main thesis a little bit? If, like, for example, if I ask you to summarize this 14 page introduction for us. Okay, uh, so uh, I think uh, for various reasons, uh, there is a, both a complete uh, lack of understanding of some of the basic uh, concepts uh, which we find in our constitution and which ought to govern our public and political life, and perhaps even our private life. And one of the attempts of this book is to clarify those concepts. Uh, the second uh, issue that has uh, uh, come to the fore uh, in the last 20, 25 years is that many of us are losing uh, a sense of discrimination between what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong. And that happens in, in uh, democrat democratic societies when people with very different understandings, with very different norms and values come into the public domain. There is bound to be a confusion, not only a cacophony of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, concepts, uh, but also a complete confusion about about uh, you know what uh, moral sense um, many of these concepts have, what moral weight they carry, and when this sense of discrimination is lost, uh, we lose uh, an you know an ethical direction. Uh, we are groping in the dark, uh, and I think my attempt is to give some kind of a moral anchorage to all of us. Uh, this is not obviously something which I. Uh, it's not a. It's not a blueprint uh, for the future. It's not. Uh, it, there is no final or definitive statement here. Uh, I myself uh, feel uh, that my proposals are tentative. But nonetheless, we have to start a conversation, and I believe that I'm giving some kind of an ethical direction to our society. I think in the last 30, 40 years. Uh, our public domain is characterized by two features. One is a failure on the part of some people to make any well value judgments at all. They either don't know which uh, kind of value judgments to make, they're not confident of them, or uh, if they do have these judgments, uh, then they keep it to themselves. They don't put them out in the open. So on the one hand, we have a great deal of moral vacuum created by the suspension of value judgments. And on the other hand, we, we have a, a, a plethora of ill-informed uh, prejudgments, you know, prejudices. We have people, there's an excess of value judgments uh, we have all kinds of negative uh, value judgments to make on others, and we have only uh, self-glorificatory 
judgments about ourselves. We think we are the greatest and we think everybody else is a fool. Uh, and I think uh, not neither of this, this kind of deep uh, of, of value subjectivism or value skepticism on the one hand, and this uh, overconfidence about, you know, your own values on the other, neither of them is very good for uh, a society where there are lots of disagreements and where people ought to be discussing uh, with each other and arriving at some kind of a common agreement or, or, uh, or a consensus on what the common good is. And uh, this is reflected in the way in which our society seems to be completely divided, completely polarized, polarized uh, where we seem, none of us can, uh, you know, uh, 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 can, can arrive at a, a reasonable, reasonable agreement on anything. And this is, of course, something which is very painful. After a consensus that we had in the 1950s and the 60s, we now seem to be a, a reaching a stage when there is complete dissensus and complete fragmentation. And uh, uh, that's what the despair part uh, of, of the title, you know, that's where it comes from. Uh, and so uh, this is an attempt to intervene, publicly intervene, uh, in this uh, uh, despairing kind of a scenario and to help us, uh, you know, find some way to get out of it. Th that's, that's, yeah. the, that's the kind of, a, uh, uh, yeah, that's what I've tried to do in the book. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that definitely, I think, even comes through in the way you've uh, categorized the 100 different essays in, into the six, seven different categories. Mm -hmm. But in from when I looked at the book, what I felt was that there were still one or two real overarching themes uh, that you wanted to bring to the table, like a really massive part that at least I felt was there was on um, the idea of secularism and whether it's under attack or whether India has lost its way. In fact, I think you have a whole section titled, Where Did We Lose Our Way? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I felt this was especially relevant in light of a few recent events regarding secularism. So in the past year, we've seen enrollment of Muslim women students at Karnataka government universities decline due to the that hijab ban that, that created a lot of controversy. Um, mm. And more recently in Uttar Pradesh, we've seen these almost extrajudicial demolitions of Muslim residences and even mosques mm -hmm. before the lower courts have even heard these respective matters. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you sort of... Uh, bring to our audiences what exactly kind of arguments that you have put forward about the secularism issue and how can Indian democracy sort of rectify this? Yeah, sure. I think uh, I, I completely agree that uh, secularism is a political perspective uh, which is relevant for everybody, all members of our community, of our, of our nation. It is not uh, restricted uh, for the good of a section, but for everyone. Uh, our secularism is not against religion. Uh, this is something that some people in some Western societies, uh, that is how they conceived it, but neither in all Western societies and certainly not in India. We have never conceived of secularism as anti-religious. So what is the core feature of Indian secularism? In my view, it is meant to uh, uh, fight or uh, resist two kinds of institutionalized religious domination. One is what we might call inter-religious. When one members of one religious community, when they do all kinds of nasty things to members of another religious community, right? When they oppress them, when they exclude them, when they marginalize them, humiliate them, degrade them, that's what I call inter-religious and secularism is meant to fight that. Uh, but there is another kind of uh, institutionalized domination that also exists, and that is within each religious community. And in fact, that is the kind of uh, institutionalized domination that inspired people in the West 
to propose a secular state in the first place. Because you remember, in the West, the fight was against the church, the state and the in, in, and individuals in the society were fighting the church because the church had at that time become very socially oppressive and politically very meddlesome. So the, it was to keep the church in its place that secularism was, in a sense, invented. Now, in India, of course, we don't have a church, but we have two, two uh, institutions, one which is kind of more or less uh, formalized, and that is caste, and the other is patriarchy. We have all kinds of religious-based uh, discriminations and exclusions and humiliations, which are uh, the the uh, the uh, the ground for victimizing women, and we have similar religious-based exclusions and discriminations, uh, which are against the lower caste, uh, the atishudras in particular. So secularism is meant to fight both. Uh, gender and caste-based discriminations in each religious community and uh, uh, religious uh, and discrimination grounded in religion, uh, which becomes the basis for dominating other religious communities by one religious community. So uh, uh, this, is the, this is the core feature of Indian secularism. Now, what has happened is that somehow for mistakes made by everybody, secularism has come, come to be identified only with inter-religious domination. And that means that it has become, because minority rights are meant to be uh, one of the ways in which you fight inter-religious domination, it's come to be identified as a defense of minority rights. Now, I think that that is a mistake. Defending minority rights is certainly one very major uh, feature of secularism. Uh, equally important is to fight um, in rights of internal minorities or rights of individu individuals within religious communities. Now, uh, that means that whenever there is an instance of, say, a forcible uh, Imp or uh, an imposition of the burqa on women within the Muslim community or a forcible restriction made uh, on, on a Hindu woman, say, not to get married to another person of her choice, then I think secularism is there to defend the rights of these women. But if, on the other hand, uh, Hindus wish Muslims to do certain things which they as a group um, uh, do not want to do, or even as individuals they do not want to do, then I think the state must come to, uh, uh, to, to restrict the actions of the majority group, right? Uh, against uh, individuals within a minority or against the minority as a group. So both are extremely important. Now, uh, you had raised uh, two uh, examples. I, I gave the background, but you talked about, uh, could, could you just repeat them? One was in Karnataka. Yeah, right? the Karnataka, the hijab ban, and how recently there's been studies showing that uh, enrollment has declined from Muslim women because of... Uh, uh, of so so now, you know, I think... Uh, the, the politically uh, uh, elected majority, whether it is Hindu or Muslim, does not really have the, uh, uh, must not have the power to intervene in the affairs of women. The choice of wearing a burqa should be with the women. If women believe that burqa is being imposed on them, then the state must intervene in defense of the rights of women. If, on the other hand, women freely choose the burqa, I don't think the state should come in and, and intervene in the affairs in, 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 in that freedom. Now, it seems to me that in Karnataka, there is an attempt to, to force Muslim women to be free. 
Uh, in other words, uh, people are over eager to get uh, rid of the burqa, even when Muslim women do not want to, uh, 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 you know, as yet at least, not under the pressure of the majority at any rate, to get rid of the burqa. So I don't think there is any reason for, for us to impose uh, the ban on burqa. Uh, this should be done freely. And this issue should certainly not get into the way of the education of women, right? I mean, just imagine, just to, to take a, an extreme example, if Swami Vivekanand, a young Swami Vivekanand, was to get into, or wanted to get into college wearing saffron clothes, then I don't think we would have any right to prevent him from uh, entering that college simply because he's wearing saffron clothes and not any other dress, right? I think this would be true even today. Um, and, and, and likewise, if some women feel that wearing a, a headdress, a hijab, for example, is something which uh, they wish to, uh, to have for whatever reason, uh, I don't think we should, we should make too much uh, you know, fuss over it. We should let it happen. And to prevent women from entering colleges and taking admission into universities or schools simply on this ground, would be great injustice. Uh, so uh, on that issue, I think I'm pretty clear. Uh, on the other issue, uh, was uh, what was that? Uh, it was to do with some of the controversies that resulted in uh, these what appear to be extrajudicial demolitions of um, residents that owned by Muslims, or in a couple of cases more recently, of mosques in different parts yeah, of. The I think that, that's a. I mean, that's a real. You know, I don't think there's any. Uh, any issue there. I think I'm very clear. There is no way that you can uh, eject people who are living, uh, whether they're Hindus or Muslims or Christians. I don't think there's any case for ejecting people uh, from, the, from, the, from wherever they're residing for many years. This is something which should be done uh, with due process. And uh, uh, there should be some place found for them in case, for, for whatever reason, uh, that place is is needed for public purpose or because of some uh, flawed practice in the past with government connivance, there is some illegal, so-called illegal uh, uh, use or occupation of the land. But if people have been living there for 40, 50, 60 years, then I don't think there is any case for removing them by force uh, within within a week, or ten days. You know that's what I heard. That no time was given to them. They were asked to be, you know, to 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 remove themselves within a week. I think that is completely. Uh, uh, I mean, it's 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 so heartless and uh, completely wrong to do that. And I don't think it has anything to do with. Uh, I mean, it may have to do with religious discrimination. But really speaking, it has very little to do with religious, you know, religion. I would say that this is true of anybody, any poor person, any, uh, uh, you know, any 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 community uh, living anywhere. If uh, that community was to be dispossessed uh, and asked to vacate overnight, uh, I think that is grossly unfair. Right, right. Uh, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I think uh, throughout your answer, you've also just sort of uh, uh, fed into a, a follow-up question that I had that you addressed about how uh, European secularism, uh, such as, let's say, the French version of, uh, of laicity, how that cannot really work in India. So I want to like flip that a little bit briefly. Um, so in, in, your, in one of your essays, I believe this is on uh, page 129, your essay on the significance of the term secular itself, mm -hmm. uh, you sort of, I feel like you sort of make a, make a prediction that um, that demands for an almost Indian style, or if I may say Nehruvian style of secularism, will there be more demands for that uh, vocally in different parts of Europe? Mm. Um, uh, did you want to expand on that point? Yeah, sure. Uh, you see, uh, uh, 
in Europe, culturally, religiously, linguistically homogenous communities. I mean, they were not totally homogenous, but relatively homogenous communities were created uh, between the 16th, 15th, and the 17th century uh, during the so called wars of religion, which were not just wars of religion, but they were also political wars and wars uh, to, for the formation of certain kinds of nations. So you had the creation of uh, multiple uh, uh, homogenous uh, communities, right? Uh, now, it was in these homogenous communities, which had rid themselves of all the diversity, that secular states were created. So uh, the real battle in Europe, in these European communities, but between the state and the church, I'd already mentioned that earlier. Uh, the church was very uh, politically meddlesome and it had become socially oppressive. And the state uh, tried to check this, uh, uh, these oppressive tendencies of, of the church and it's, uh, a, a, as well as this political, uh, you know, habit of political interference. So this was a... Uh, Secularism developed in relatively homogenous communities. Now, this homogeneity was created in very unethically undesirable ways by violence and so on. But let's leave that for the time being. The point that I'm making is that these uh, there was very little diversity in each of these nation states, and secularism was born uh, in these ethic and these homogenous uh, communities. Uh, with the idea that there should be a separation between the church and the state. India, on the other hand, is very different. Uh, religious diversity has been part of its natural landscape. There were no wars of religion. There was no uh, cleansing, at least until the 20th century, until 1947. We hadn't seen major wars of religion. Uh, and. Uh, so uh, the whole point of a secular state was not just to maintain some kind of a separation between church and state, but to make sure that there were uh, the, that uh, there was religious pluralism. Uh, there was no inter-religious domination, as I mentioned. Apart from that, of course, there was the other issue of intra-religious domination, but we keep that aside for the moment. Now, these are, they, this makes the Indian situation very different from the West. However, what has happened since the Second World War with the intensification of decolonization and with a lot of uh, immigration uh, from these colonies to Europe, an unprecedented diversity has been recreated in modern societies within Europe, right? Uh, societies which were at one time relatively homogenous have now become heterogeneous. So there is religious diversity there as well. In that sense, a lot of European societies have begun to resemble what India is now. And just as Indian secularism uh, was uh, in kind of uh, instituted or invented in order to deal with uh, religious diversity, this secularism now would come in very handy as not a blueprint, but as, a, as an example for Europe, which also has religious diversity. So uh, that's the point that I was making, that uh, in U Europe today would have to look more and more towards Indian secularism. Unfortunately, the practice of India in the last 10, 15 years has not been a very healthy. Uh, with respect to their own ideals of secularism, right? We've not been following our own practices. Instead of respect and diversity, we are uh, uh, we are uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, re rejecting it. We are uh, 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 dismissing it. Uh, we, we are <laughs> we are we are ridiculing it. Uh, but but uh, but if we so that practice is not very uh, exemplary. 
But the ideals which are enshrined in the constitution, and at least the best practices of Indian state, are certainly very exemplary, right? Uh, right, right. For Europe. So uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I meant when I said that the French and the uh, and the and the and other European societies would do well to look up to the best practices of the Indian state as well as to the Indian constitution in order to deal with their own problems, which problems are also ar emerged arising because of the presence of deep diversity in their societies now, which was not the case, you know, 75, 80 years ago. Yeah, yeah, that makes uh, that makes perfect sense, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, let's let's switch gears a little bit right now. Actually, I wanted to get more into the weeds of some of the other issues you've brought up. So other than secularism, uh, felt like you also devoted a, quite a bit of uh, uh, time to talking about education in India. Mm -hmm. And obviously, um, uh, a big issue that I think may come up would be the future of the Indian public education system, mm -hmm. uh, given the fact that the new education policy now is inviting foreign universities um, as well. So I guess uh, what I wanted to know from you was that, that what do you see the future of the public system being? Uh, because in the future now, there may be the risk of... Uh, uh, there may, there may be the risk of these foreign universities also coming in and poaching some of the high quality faculty talent that hasn't already been hired by other private players like a Jindal or an Ashoka University. Mm. No, I always believe that, uh, you know, the Indian education system uh, was uh, until recently and prob probably still is. It is uh, uh, in... Uh, the so-called uh, non-Western, uh, non-communist, uh, and non-Europe, uh, Western European and American uh, countries, it was certainly one of the best. Uh, uh, we had uh, uh, terrific universities, uh, and uh, we uh, are at the forefront of. Uh, many uh, social science disciplines, uh, and I can't say about science, but some of our institutions of science have been absolutely uh, brilliant. You know, uh, the IIS in Bangalore and and so on. The IITs, of course. Um, uh, so, so we we had set up a, a pretty good system, and instead of trying to improve upon them. Uh, I think uh, in a very absented manner, and if I may say so, in some kind of a ham-handed manner, we're trying to uh, push in uh, changes both within the system uh, uh, and also bringing you know, all kinds of uh, universities from outside is only going to add more confusion. Uh, I think there is no harm if university from outside come, but there should be no two ways about one thing. Uh, they should improve existing systems. They should not undermine them. Uh, and my fear is that uh, we are destroying our systems, our university system as it exists today, and replacing them with these universities. Instead of, that is a very, very, uh, um, to my mind, a very sickening uh, development. We should allow these universities to come, but to uh, ensure a healthy competition with the existing universities with the clear purpose of ensuring that the current system improves. Uh, that is how we should have thought, but I don't think we've, we, th this, is, this, is, this is happening. And, and that seems to me very troubling. Uh, the second thing that I want to say, and I think many of my, uh, some of my papers at least have uh, uh, in, in this book uh, uh, draw attention to that. You know, it's no point having a good science and technology if you do not have educated human beings. Uh, and those that by educated human beings, I mean, 
um, what should I, there's a German word called Bildung. You know, it's kind of cult, people who are cultivated in their sensibility and in their ethical and moral uh, senses, uh, both in the cultural, cultural culturally sophisticated, uh, but also morally and ethically uh, developed. Uh, it is these human beings who have to handle these machines, and uh, they are the ones who are going to handle uh, all the all the technology. Uh, so uh, it's no use giving people science degrees and degrees in uh, advanced technologies if uh, if uh, these human themselves humans themselves um, are are uh, are impoverished. In 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 their in 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 their ethical, moral, aesthetic, cultural sensitivity, and this sensitivity can only develop with the humanities. It's you get a a proper perspective on things by reading philosophy and literature. Uh, you know, you 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 un, you have a better sense of what is happening in your society uh, by by. Uh, by by being able to uh, use the uh, the the results of uh, good social science, you develop a better sense of the past by the best history that is available to you, uh, and it's only these uh, these properly educated uh, young men and women uh, who will be best equipped to. Uh, make the best use of uh, new science and technology. Uh, uh, so I think uh, all uh, degrees in science and technology uh, must go hand in hand with a proper training, a proper education in the humanities and, the, and social science. They shouldn't be fragmented. But what we are, what is happening today is too much emphasis on a certain kind of technology, a, a certain kind of uh, scientific thinking, and too little investment in the humanities, uh, in the so-called liberal arts education, right? Now, I think uh, we must uh, very quickly uh, 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 rectify this, or else we will, you know, literally we'll be producing uh, I, I hate to say this. I, this is not a word that that I would like to use, and I'm exaggerating it, it a bit. But we don't want monsters uh, to be dealing with, uh, uh, you know, te technology. We 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 don't want technology to rule us or technology to fall into into the wrong hands. We want technology to be ruled by us and be used for the benefit of humankind. And uh, for that, you need a proper sense, a proper perspective, uh, a certain ethical and moral worldview. And uh, our public education system must uh, realize uh, uh, the importance of this. Uh, I, I'm not sure uh, whether we are, uh, you know, we are, we are moving in this in this direction that I just outlined, uh, and that sort of pains me. Uh, yeah, and I guess related to that also was uh, another point I, I had with me about the question of the future of student demographics. Mm -hmm. um, like, what do you feel, for example, about the potential removal by the government of these uh, basic scholarships for some of these minority groups in India? I, I mean, uh, the uh, for me, uh, um, anybody who is uh, deprived uh, uh, for whatever reason, because he or she belongs to a particular caste or to a particular community or to a, a very vulnerable uh, economic group. Uh, anybody who, because of the disadvantage that accrue from belonging to certain categories, if if uh, those people, if those uh, young men and women are deprived of uh, a proper education, I would think that that's wrong. Uh, and uh, we should do everything uh, possible uh, within our power to make sure that everybody 
is able to achieve uh, uh, what is uh, necessary uh, for the development of their basic human capabilities. Uh, and, and so uh, if it is true that taking these uh, uh, um, resources away from the minority groups are, uh, is going to uh, end up disadvantaging them, then that is clearly unacceptable to me. Uh, I would say the same thing about, uh, uh, you know, uh, marginalized women, marginalized Dalits, and also uh, the very poor amongst us, no matter which community they belong to. If it is done with the clear intention of dispossessing or disadvantaging these minority groups, then it's completely unacceptable. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. And I, uh, I think since you brought up the point of deprivation as well, I think that leads into uh, our next topic. And actually, I wanted to sort of put these two together because you've written essays on the importance of universities, public universities like a JNU, mm -hmm. which is often uh, under public scrutiny or media scrutiny, for example. And mm -hmm. with the other essay you wrote in a different section on the quote ignominy of statelessness. Mm -hmm. um, so, so going off of that, um, like, what do you think India needs to do to sort of live up to its stated goals of becoming this like global education hub? One issue that we sort of reported on recently at the print is that even now, Afghan students have been unable to secure visas from the MEA to return to India and complete their degrees at exactly at universities like a JNU or a South Asian university. So that's sort of my question. What do you think sort of India needs to do to live up to those goals? I mean, this is a, a the answer to that is obvious. I mean, uh, you're talking about people who started their education but are unable to return. So quite clearly, yeah, yeah. The this, price of the quite clearly, uh, we should do everything in our power to enable them to return and to complete their education. Uh, this is one of this is what makes you uh, a, a, an important global hub of education, right? You get everybody from around uh, you. Um, uh, to to come because you are able to provide. I mean, if we have aspirations to be Vishwa Guru, but I think it would be nice to have an aspiration of being just Guru to all our neighbors. Um, uh, and, yeah. and uh, you know, I don't think there is anything uh, like, a, like a Vishwa Guru in everything. Um, we must learn from each other. I mean, I would rather have a system where one country is a guru to another country in whatever it is that it's good at, and vice versa. So I would like, uh, you know, South Asia to to uh, to help uh, how South Asian countries to help one another, learn from each other in whatever it is that we happen to be good at, or we have become good at. So yeah, I'm. Uh, it's it's obvious that uh, Afghan students should come, and there should be. They shouldn't be, I don't know if, if this is a case of discrimination, that's even more appalling. Uh, uh, if there are some other reasons why they're not able to come back, uh, we can examine them and remove uh, the impediments. But if they're not coming back simply because they happen to be, you know, of a particular religion, then it's even worse. So of course, they should come and, 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 uh, and complete their education in India. Uh, yeah, it's definitely been uh, difficult to sort of get a handle of what's getting in the way of perhaps approving some of these visas. Because even if you move away from India to other parts of, of Asia, I read recently that Pakistan has been deporting hundreds of Afghans who had arrived there as, uh, as re refugees over the years or even since the rise of the Taliban. And Turkey sort of uh, done the same thing as well. So I, I guess related to what you said, it's India sort of needs to look at uh, what it really wants its stated goals to be in issues like education. Mm. Uh, but I want to sort of move away or move ahead to what we haven't really covered yet, which is sort of your the final section of your book. You're sort of looking ahead to the future. Um, one essay that stood out to me was um, a wish list that you've sort of created for for new mm. governments. Mm. Um, and but within those subheads, it seemed like there was not a contradictory, but almost like a like a dichotomy. Uh, like, how do you think a government can balance out um, 
a form of popular populism or listening to public criticism while still protecting human rights and aspects like cultural heritage that have historically been eroded regardless of who's in power. Uh, you know, it's human, a, a, a good human flourishing uh, is possible not by pursuing a single good, but by having many goods. And it's well known, at least to many of us, that uh, all these uh, pursuits of these different goods uh, cannot be done uh, uh, in, a, in a very smooth, uh, conflict-free manner. That these goods sometimes come into straightforward conflict with one another. And sometimes the pursuit of each of these goods um, comes into a very uh, similar kind of conflict. So uh, you cannot live your life in the pursuit of all your goods without facing some difficulties, some conflicts. Now, uh, I've always believed that uh, a simple trade-off is not a good idea. You cannot give up one thing in order to achieve something else. Uh, totally. Because if both goods are important to you, then giving up one completely would give you enormous suffering. I mean, just take uh, the uh, to, to our own example. Um, we have uh, we love our children. If we are, uh, you know, if we happen to have families, but we also have to uh, pursue our own uh, uh, job. We have to do a job, or 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 if there is. A, uh, uh, if some kind of work gives us uh, enormous satisfaction, then we wish to uh, engage in that work. Now, it is never possible that both can be pursued without any kind of conflict. But I don't think any sensible person will give up uh, looking after the interests of his child completely in order to do his work or to pursue his job. You may do it for some time, but you will not be able to do it for too long, because if you do that, then you, you know, you really uh, do a lot of harm to your children, and you that you, you, you either wouldn't want to, or if you want, you shouldn't want. Uh, so balancing is the right answer for me. You have to balance these goods. Uh, you, 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 you have to pursue all of them knowing full well that uh, all of them can be, cannot be pursued with the same degree of intensity and with the same dedication all the time. Uh, so you give, some, some atten you give attention to one, uh, more attention to one and less to the other, but over a period of time, you will shift uh, your attention to whatever it is that you have neglected. Uh, and that is how life is generally lived by people. And that is a good uh, way of living your uh, personal life as well as your collective life. So uh, uh, I would say that uh, none, we, we shouldn't, uh, 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 now what, what was the question that you had asked? Uh, which, which was the last wish list, yes. Uh, you would yeah. open a wish list. And yeah, so I would say that any government, I mean, should have a wish list of several things that it wishes to do. Uh, and uh, it should never, uh, if all of them are roughly equally important, then it should never give up any one for the sake of something else. Right? Yeah, and I'm actually, I'm actually really glad you have the point of, uh, of trade offs because I think that's sort of comes full circle with one of the first questions uh, I asked you about uh, about the Karnataka State Universities and the hijab ban. It, it almost sort of seemed like in a in a quest for um, uh, criticizing or banning modesty clothing. There's almost sort of a trade off that, that that perhaps less people will get educated in the near future and less women Muslim women will get educated in the, in the near future. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's that's something for um, the government or whichever. Uh, government to to think about, um, and unfortunately, for uh, in the interest of time, that was our last question. 
Uh, mm-hmm. But I'll just reiterate to everyone. Uh, Professor Rajiv Bhargav's new book, Between Hope and Despair, 100 Ethical Reflections on Contemporary India. It's, it's out now. Get your copies. And yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.